Hello everyone and welcome to Classic Gamer 74. My name is Lawson. I am the Tasmanian Tiger or Thylazine and today is my episode and we're going to talk about attempted video game mascots. In the video game world there have been some great mascots that are identifiable to particular game companies. For instance it's well known that Mario stands alone as the uh, mascot of Nintendo, uh, Sega has Sonic, and uh, Ocean, or even, I guess you could say, the ZX Spectrum computer from uh, England has Dizzy. So what about some other game systems and game companies? Did they have their own mascots, or did they try to have them? So that's what we're going to be looking at today, or some of these failed, uh, attempted mascots for various different game companies or game or computer systems. Now I'm not saying that these games were a failure, some of them fall from it. I'm just saying that the expectations set for some of these characters were a little high and didn't quite meet uh, the expectations that the companies had set for them. So without further ado, let's get started. And the first one we're going to start with today is Bubsy. <sighs> One thing I think you'll notice in today's video is quite a few of these uh, characters and games are trying to be the next Sonic. Yep, or the next Mario, or a combination of both actually. And Bubsy is no exception. The so, we're going to look at the first Bubsy game, which uh, incidentally has quite an interesting title to it. Uh, so, let's go ahead and check it out. Alright, the full title of this game is Bubsy in Claws Encounters of the Third Kind. Now, this game was released way back in 1993 and was uh, first released in May of that year for the Super NES. Uh, this game was published by uh, Accolade and was uh, programmed by D. Scott Williamson uh, for the NES Joel Sida. Now, um, yeah. These uh, enemies called Woolies uh, intend to steal Earth's supply of yarn balls. And since Bubsy has the world's largest collection of yarn balls, he has the most at stake and sets out to stop the Woolies and reclaim yarn balls. Yeah. Um, right. This game was not really well received by a lot of people. Um, Depending on who you ask, uh, the first couple games were okay. Uh, the Genesis version seemed to get a little bit more love than the Super NES version. But then they came out with that Bubsy 3D game for the PlayStation. Ugh. And, you know, it's kind of been quiet in the Bubsy camp ever since. Um, some people thought that maybe with time Bubsy would, you know, gain some sort of cult following, but basically most people, including myself, consider Bubsy to be a very, very poor substitute for Sonic. The controls of this game are simply atrocious. Um, one hit and you die, although they do give you a lot of lives, which is a plus because you're going to die quite a few times on this game. Uh, even the smart comments that he makes don't help much, so um, I'm not going to tell you not to go out and play it because you probably will after seeing this, but to be honest with you, it's not a great game and probably one that is best forgotten. And our next game is Bonk's Adventure for the Turbo Graphics 16. And I know some of you are thinking, but Lawson, that game was also made for the NES. Well, that's true, it was. But the NES version didn't come out till later, and, you know, it was a late release, and now it's very valuable. What I'm talking about is the original uh, Bonk game that came out for the Turbo Graphics 16 in 1989. So let's check that out. Alright, in this platformer game, you take on the role of Bonk the Caveman. Now, your girlfriend has been kidnapped, and unfortunately, you don't have any weapons. Although, you do have a very, very large hard head. And boy, that seems to do the damage, I tell you. You walk around here, and you just bonk your enemies in the head with your head, either by jumping Bonk or just smashing them in the head, which is pretty cool, actually. 
I really think, though, that had the Topographic 16 been a big hit or a bigger hit, uh, Bonk would have probably been uh, more successful and probably could have, you know, carried the company. Uh, I mean, the guy from uh, Splatterhouse wasn't going to do it. But regardless, uh, unfortunately, the Topographic 16 and even the Topographic 16 CD were not a big success in North America. They were in Japan, but, you know, not on. Uh, this side of the pond. So, uh, Bonk himself has kind of become uh, forgotten, kind of like uh, the system he was intended to be the mascot for. And next up, we have Pac Man. Now, there's no denying that Pac Man was probably one of the greatest and most successful video games of all time. I mean, the arcade game was a tremendous hit. And uh, the company that made it, Pally Midway, knew that I had a big hit. Uh, Pac-Man was very smartly marketed. He appeared on uh, a cartoon series, cereal, t-shirts, uh, plushies, an alarm clock, a handheld version, you name it. Well, Atari decided they wanted to get in on the action, so they secured the license to make their own port of Pac-Man. They were so enthusiastic, in fact, about this that they pretty much marketed the heck out of it. And if you could look in a catalog, you can see that it got a nice two-page spread. Well, that's kind of where the trouble started, I'm afraid. A lot of times in life, I've learned that if something gets hyped up a little too much, it's always going to be a disappointment. Now, if you look at this spread right here that I've got uh, from the 1988 one catalog, it says here, Pac-Man, uh, adapted from one of the most popular video arcade games ever created, Atari's Pac-Man, which differs slightly from the original, is sure to be a big hit in your home. Well, yeah, it's, it did differ slightly. And here we have it, the Atari 2600 port of Pac-Man. Unfortunately, yeah, it, it was a big disappointment to a lot of people. Now, I'm not going to say to everyone, because, you know, we don't speak for everybody out there. There were some people who really enjoyed it. I personally did, uh, because I was a young pup back then, and I didn't get to go to an arcade till I was older, because my parents wouldn't take me when we were at the mall. So, this was my first introduction to Pac-Man. Unfortunately, as much as I liked it, and a few other people out there did, I'm sure, uh, the majority of people hated it. Um, the game was rushed, the quality, the flicker wasn't good, the flicker especially was kind of annoying, uh, the levels didn't change like in the arcade, of course, uh, people kind of forget that they didn't have a lot of memory to work with back then. Uh, regardless, uh, whatever hopes that Atari had for Pac-Man didn't pan out. Now, uh, the Miss Pac-Man port for the 2600 was better, and then they had one for the 5200. Um, and then when the 7800 rolled around, they only had Miss Pac-Man for it, although uh, Robert De Crescenzo and all the great uh, homebrew programmers uh, did make Pac-Man for it, and, of course, the great baby Pac-Man. Um, and then there was a Junior Pac-Man and Pac-Man Plus and Super Pac-Man. But anyway, the point is, uh, it becoming the, uh, the mascot for Atari didn't really work out like they hoped it had. Had more time been allowed and even more memory, chances are good uh, it may have worked out differently. What do you think? Let me know what you think about the whole Pac-Man and Atari situation in the uh, comment section below. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Next up, we have Pitfall Harry from Activision. Now, there's no denying that Pitfall was a tremendous success. And it made sense because he came out around the same time as Indiana Jones, uh, which was vastly popular. And the game itself was just cracking fun. I mean, you have to admit that. Uh, however, I don't know about him being much of a mascot. Um, you know, I mean, he wasn't Indiana Jones uh, by any stretch. And... It wouldn't be until the second game uh, when he would kind of come into his own. Um, they did try to make a Saturday morning cartoon uh, that went along with the Donkey Kong cartoon, but it didn't last very long, and I don't think people really saw Pitfall Harry as a mascot of sorts. Although the game itself has gone into legendary status and is still fondly remembered, uh, Pitfall Harry himself, eh, not so much. 
And next up, we have KC Munchkin for the Magnavox Odyssey 2. Now, sadly, the Magnavox Odyssey 2 was not a great success. I'm not exactly sure why it was a bigger hit in uh, Europe and in Brazil than it was in the United States. I think part of the problem was the fact that you just had the other three great consoles, the uh, ColecoVision, Atari, and the Intellivision. Also for the fact that it didn't help that uh, uh, Magnavox or Philips got sued for this game. Uh, as you can see, yeah, it's quite similar in many, many ways uh, to Pac-Man and of course Atari owned the rights to uh, or had purchased uh, licensing at that time, so they weren't happy about it. Now, they did come out with a sequel called Casey's Crazy Chase, which you're looking at right here. Now, in this one, you are, once again, Casey, and you're trying to eat uh, this snake or centipede or whatever it is from behind until you're totally consumed. Yeah, but you got the ghosties coming at you and you got other stuff, but personally, I think that if the Magnavox Odyssey 2 had been a success, uh, this game would have more, been more fondly remembered. Actually, it kind of had a resurgence a couple years ago when the amazing programmer Robert De Crescenzo made his own version of it for the Atari 7800, which was just magnificent. So, uh, this is definitely filed under Lost Classic, because I'll tell you what, I have some great memories playing both of these games on the Magnavox Odyssey 2. Next up we have Frogger from Parker Brothers. Now I know what you're saying, they didn't come up with it, it was a successful arcade game before it was ported out. Well, that's true. Uh, same for Pac-Man, except for in this case, Frogger was a tremendous success. I mean, oh man, it was just a big success no matter where they Parker Brothers ported it out. And I think that they kind of really wanted uh, the frog to be, you know, kind of their mascot. I mean, they had lots of commercials, uh, really fun ones, and they even made a sequel that only got released on the game systems. That game being Frogger 2 3 Deep, where instead of just crossing the street in the swamp uh, to get back to your lily pad, this time you're going to across multiple different areas. Of course, this game was a big hit too. Uh, unfortunately, the video game crash of 83 and 84 is kind of what stopped uh, the success, I think, for Parker Brothers and they got out of the game, uh, the video game market, uh, not long after that. Um, which, of course, was sad because there were some games that they had planned that never got released. Of course, the Frogger Legacy did continue years later, as other modern game consoles did put out their own Frogger games. But, uh, unfortunately, back in the early 80s, uh, bigger things were probably planned for our little amphibian friend. Now, ColecoVision made a very smart marketing move by purchasing the licensing for the characters of Smurfs. Now, of course, the Smurfs have made a big comeback in recent years here, or not so recent, but these little blue creatures were all the rage back in the late 70s and early 80s, from the comic strip that came from Pale, uh, to the cartoon, uh, the toys, etc, etc, etc. However, um, the video game Smurf became a big hit. Uh, both versions were very successful, the one made here for the ColecoVision and even the one ported for the uh, Atari 2600. Of course, the Intellivision version never came out, but that's a whole different story. So, with this licensing in hand, they obviously had some pretty big plans or expectations for the little blue creatures. One such project was this one here that they came up with for the uh, Atari 2600. Now this was called Smurfs Save the Day. And in this game, you actually used cassette tapes, remember those, uh, and plug it in with your Atari 2600 um, through a special adapter. Now this adapter would uh, help you to play these cassettes through your Atari 2600 and you could uh, learn things and you had real speech and everything. The game itself is really cool but unfortunately was not a big success. Uh, there were plans to make this for the ColecoVision but no playable ROM has been found as of yet that I know of. 
Now, if you look at this advertisement that came with uh, a ColecoVision game, you see that they had plans to make uh, a play and learning cartridge, uh, I guess a Smurf edutainment game for the ColecoVision. Um, I wonder if the uh, version that, that was released for the 2600 is what was actually the release, as uh, no hide no hair this game ever has been found that I know of. The last product that they came up with was the Smurf Paint and Play. Now this is kind of like a very, very early version of Mario Paint. You can do kind of cool things like paint pictures and make scenes and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, but had the video game crash of 83 and 84 not happened, had Coleco uh, not declared bankruptcy, I wonder what other plans they may have had for the Smurfs. Uh, what do you think? Let me know in the comments below. And last, but certainly least, we have my least favorite game here and probably of all time, Awesome Possum. Ugh. All right, here we go again with another character that's trying to be the next Sonic. Now, um, yeah, this bouncy little fella is trying to clean up the environment, so he's stopping the litterers, picking up garbage, and uh, one of the taglines for this game is he talks. And he does. Actually, he never shuts the hell up throughout the whole bloody game. And so you spend most of the time just jumping around and hoping he'll shut up eventually. Ugh. And of course, this game was not well received by a lot of fans out there. And if they didn't like it or decide to play it, the best thing to do was to turn the volume all the way down so you didn't have to listen to him run his mouth. Uh, yet another example of uh, a game company that being. Uh, what? Who made this? Oh, Tangan. Yes, and of course, Tangan's history is just full of controversy, but we'll talk about that in another video. And so, uh, this was Tangan trying to get their own mascot, and it really didn't work. And that's all we have for today for my episode. Uh, I have a feeling Anthony's gonna make a sequel to this, or maybe let me do it, uh, because there were some other characters I wanted to talk about that didn't quite make it through the cut. I mean, I don't want to be here all day, do we? Do we? <laughs> I mean, but regardless, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, let us know by liking the video, sharing it with some friends and family if you think they like it, and please subscribe if you haven't already. And don't forget to click that little bell icon down there so you'll be notified when we upload new episodes. Okay, if I'm not mistaken, uh, let me check the notes right here. Oh, yes, it looks like uh, next week is Red's episode, and he's going to talk about handheld games and those Nintendo Game & Watch uh, games. So be looking forward to that one there. Well, until next time, I am Lawson the Thylazine, wishing you all a great week. Be strong, be happy, be healthy. And above all, take care of each other, be kind to each other, and stop hate of all kinds. And don't forget about the contest, either. Alright, y'all have a cracking week, and I'll see you soon. Goodbye!